On November the 30th, 1934, a locomotive called Flying Scotsman roared into the record books as the fastest steam loco in the world. Flying Scotsman's speed of 100 miles per hour seemed an extraordinary achievement in an age when railway companies were fighting to win customers in the face of the rising threat of road transport. Scotsman's operator, the London and North Eastern Railway, LNER, lost no time in making the most of the achievement, and soon the world's fastest train became known as the world's favourite train. Today, a hundred years since its creation, and despite many setbacks, the Flying Scotsman still lays claim to the title, the most famous train in the world. For 50 years since the last steam locomotives were retired by the then National Network Rail Operator British Rail, among the very last to go was one of the most famous of them all, the Flying Scotsman. That the Flying Scotsman still runs to this day, 100 years later, is remarkable. It's a tale tinged with disaster, financial ruin, love, tenacity and rebirth. There have been many times when it seemed that the Flying Scotsman had pulled its last train, only for the engine to be rescued at the 11th hour. Scotsman's longevity is due in no small part to public interest in the country's steam heritage. Arguably, Flying Scotsman is the reason why so many people are drawn to preserved railways or riding on the main line in carriages pulled by a steam locomotive. Today, there are around 150 heritage railways in Britain, covering some 560 miles of track. Many pass through stunning scenery, often on narrow gauge tracks. But there are also a handful of steam locomotives, which, because of their size and power, are allowed to pull trains for special tours on the national network. The forefront of this movement is Flying Scotsman. Whenever one of the big locos is out, crowds pack the platforms and crossings just to get a glimpse of these magnificent engines as they pass through. Flying Scotsman is one of the most elegant and charismatic engines ever built. When it first rolled out of the Doncaster Works in 1923, Britain's railways were going through a major change. Following the end of the First World War, there was huge expansion in building road networks as cars and a plentiful supply of ex-military vans and trucks enabled greater personal and commercial mobility. This Little Austin 7 was launched in 1923, the same year as Flying Scotsman. Small, relatively cheap to buy, it typifies the sort of challenges the railways faced. As subsidised road building increased, Railways were all but ignored, leading to many smaller lines falling out of use altogether. In response, scores of rail companies were merged into four big companies. Great Western Railway, London, Midland and Scottish Railway, Southern Railway 
and London and North Eastern Railway. London and North Eastern Railway, or LNER, ran services up the East Coast from London to Edinburgh via York and Newcastle. It was responsible for hauling over a third of Britain's coal, and freight accounted for two-thirds of its income. But it was LNER's passenger services that caught the public eye, especially its service to Edinburgh. It was known as the Flying Scotsman and left London's King's Cross at 10 o'clock every morning. This was an era in which speed and style captured the public imagination. LNER recognised this quickly and presented an image of glamour, fast trains and sophisticated destinations. LNER also had one of the best steam locomotive engineers of the day, Nigel Gresley. As chief mechanical engineer, he was responsible for some of the most famous steam locomotives in the world, including Flying Scotsman and the streamlined A4s that were to replace Flying Scotsman. It was one of these, Mallard, that set the world record for a steam loco. The newly honoured Sir Nigel Gresley was held in such high esteem that the 100th engine built to his design, an A4, was named after him. Following the grouping of the myriad railway companies into just four big operators, the newly created LNER inherited one of the country's most famous services, the Special Scotch Express, also known informally as the Flying Scotsman. The service dates back to 1862, beginning with simultaneous departures at 10am from Edinburgh's Waverley Station and London's King's Cross. The journey took around ten and a half hours, including a half hour stop at York. But LNER faced stiff competition for the London to Scotland service from the newly created London, Midland and Scottish Railway. Their non-stop Royal Scot service ran up the western side of the country. A long-standing agreement between the West and East Coast operators limited the journey time to 8 hours and 15 minutes, even though improvements in locomotive technology meant that the journey time could be considerably shortened. Following the merger, LNER decided to rebrand the service by naming it the Flying Scotsman in 1924. As luck would have it, LNER had just the right engine to haul the new service. While a Great Northern Railway prior to its merger, Nigel Gresley had created a new A1 class of locomotive, which were big and powerful and ultimately proved successful. They were noticed as well, not just by Gresley's peers, but also by the press and the public. But nothing caught the imagination quite like the third engine of the 79 made. Built in 1923 at the Doncaster Works, it didn't have a name, just the number 1472. The new A1s were the most powerful locomotives of the day, but before 1472 could begin service, it was chosen for display at the 1924 British Empire exhibition held at Wembley, which was a showcase for achievements from around the Empire. Not ones to pass up a public relations opportunity, LNER gave the engine the name Flying Scotsman. A legend was born. It wasn't until 1928 that Flying Scotsman pulled its first train to Edinburgh. It had retained its name and had been renumbered 4472. It completed the 392 mile journey without stopping, setting a new world record in the process. Driver and crew were able to change over during the journey via a corridor running through the tender. Water was replenished 
by scooping it from a trough between the rails. Journey times started to tumble. By the time Flying Scotsman set its world record of 100 miles per hour in 1934, London to Edinburgh could be covered in just under seven and a half hours. By now, Flying Scotsman had been upgraded to an A3-class locomotive with a boiler capable of producing greater pressures and new, more efficient valves and cylinders. The engine had become the most famous in the world. In 1929, it even starred in British cinema's first feature film made with synchronous sound, The Flying Scotsman. Starring Pauline Johnson and Ray Milland, it was a pretty forgettable crime caper, although many scenes were filmed on the London to Edinburgh service. However, LNER were furious, as it showed scenes which broke almost every safety rule in the book. It was the kind of message LNER had worked hard to distance itself from. Rail travel was fast but safe. Nigel Gresley insisted that a disclaimer was shown in the opening titles. Many years later, in 1983, Ray Milland was reunited with Flying Scotsman during a visit to Carnforth. By 1935, Flying Scotsman's role as LNER's flagship faced a new challenge as the first of a new generation of A4s entered service on the East Coast Main Line. Also designed by Nigel Gresley, these sleek aerodynamic engines were capable of pulling trains at high speed. Indeed, in 1938, an A4 called Mallard set a new outright world speed record of 126 miles per hour, a record that still stands to this day. Following the success of Gresley's streamlined A4s, Flying Scotsman was no longer the LNER's flagship engine and was relegated to lesser duties, but still worked on the main line and hauling passenger services. At the outbreak of the Second World War in 1939, Flying Scotsman was pressed into service carrying troops and evacuees. Like every other engine, it was painted black to make it less conspicuous to German aircraft. The end of the Second World War in 1945 brought with it a period of reconstruction. As part of the process, industries were brought under government control. In 1948, LNER was merged with Great Britain's other railway companies to form British Railways. Flying Scotsman, the future looked bleak. Diesels and electrification were taking over. Flying Scotsman was reallocated to the Leicester Central Shed, where it began pulling passenger trains between Nottingham and London. As part of the merger, locomotives were given new numbers. From now on, Flying Scotsman would be known as 60103. It had also sprouted smoke deflectors to help the driver's visibility, especially on cold days when the smoke would fill the footplate. But the writing was on the wall and it was announced that Flying Scotsman was to be retired. On the 14th of January 1963, Flying Scotsman hauled its last train. It marked the end of nearly 40 years' service during which it had completed over two million miles. To add insult to injury, Flying Scotsman wasn't even selected for preservation by a proposed National Railway Museum. There were many calls to save the engine, but it seemed that Flying Scotsman's final journey would be to the breaker's yard. It was a one-off. I mean, there were originally about 80 of those unstreamlined locomotives built and it is the only survivor of the unstreamlined Pacifics. I, quite by chance, was appointed a part-time member of what in those days was the British Transport Commission. And as such, I had a sort of inside um, view of what was going on about the modernization program. And it became quite clear that there were going to be no unstreamlined Greater Pacifics preserved. And I felt that was a great shame. And historically, not a very good thing anyway. And I persuaded the then general manager of the Eastern Region of British Rail, 
that if it got to the point where they were going to be scrapping all the unstreamlined engines, I would like to do something about it and make sure that one of them got saved. Alan Pegler had first set eyes on Flying Scotsman as a young boy at the 1924 British Empire exhibition. Like many after him, he was smitten by the powerful but graceful lines of Gresley's design. A successful business career enabled Pegler to indulge his passion for steam railways at a time when interest in preserving them was just starting. In 1950, the narrow-gauge Talechlin Railway in Snowdonia became the world's first preserved heritage line run entirely by volunteers. Others soon followed. Alan Pegler was invited to invest in the nearby Festiniog Railway, becoming its chairman. Thus, the opportunity to buy Flying Scotsman came at just the right moment. Such was the fame of Flying Scotsman that a group of enthusiasts tried to raise the asking price of £3,000. They failed to raise the money, and so Pegler decided to buy the engine outright. Eventually, of course, that situation did arise, and I felt that the only engine that really, really that stood out from all the others was Flying Scotsman. That was the one I wanted to save. And I got the idea at the same time, don't ask me where I got it from, uh, it'd be a great idea if one could keep the thing running. It's goodbye to the most famous engine of all time, the Flying Scotsman, the giant among giants of the Romantic Age of Steam, built 40 years ago at Doncaster. Happily, the Scotsman's not going to be scrapped, for she's been bought by a Nottinghamshire businessman and railway. Alan Pegler had achieved his ambition and was now the proud owner of Flying Scotsman. <laughs> 14th of January 1963, Britain was in the grip of the coldest winter in 200 years. But for the engineers in King's Cross's top shed, there was work to be done. This was to be the last time that Flying Scotsman was to pull a train for British Rail, a journey from King's Cross to Doncaster. But would this be the last time the engine was seen running? The early 1960s were a time of great turmoil for British Railways. Dr Richard Beeching was appointed to lead the programme that would stem the big losses incurred through increased competition from road transport and reduced government subsidies. While this was going on, Pegler had successfully negotiated the contract he needed in order to keep Flying Scotsman running. The reaction one got was, well, of course, you can't do that. You can't have a private engine running on British railways. Uh, and uh, I, more or less, in, in reply, said, well, why not? And uh, it was very interesting because one of the provisos was that if I was going to buy the engine and even attempt to keep it running, I'd got to have somewhere to keep it. And uh, this uh, was to, got up into very high circles indeed. The deputy chairman of the British Railways Board who was uh, Dr. Beeching's uh, right-hand man, Sir Stuart Mitchell by name. And he had just been put in charge of the workshops. So I had to approach him and I said, uh, can you find me somewhere to keep this engine? And he finally said he could. And uh, only at that stage did it all percolate through to the great doctor. And poor old Beeching nearly had a fit apparently. He said, you know, we can't possibly have anything like this. Uh, but sadly, uh, it had all been done very officially through the chief solicitor of the British Railways Board, and the uh, heads of agreement that had been drawn up uh, were such that, um, like it or not, I had got an agreement. And so when British Rail finally with the Drew steam in 1968, there they were with this one locomotive allowed to go on running to their absolute horror, <laughs> or to Beechie's horror anyway. <laughs> So there we were, and so we were for the, that year, 1968, until I went away with the engines to North America in 1969, the only steam locomotive allowed to run on British Rail. As part of the deal, Pegler negotiated a complete overhaul of the locomotive. He wanted it restored back to what he regarded as the golden era of the LNER. Flying Scotsman was converted back to a single chimney, the smoke deflectors removed and the loco repainted in LNER apple green livery. The tender was also exchanged for a corridor type. 
At the end of March, ten weeks after the work began, Flying Scotsman appeared in public again, resplendent in the LNER apple green colour and the number 4472 restored to the sides of the cab. Several low-key runs were made to make sure the engine was ready to run on the main line. Then, on a wet Saturday, the 20th of April, 1963, Flying Scotsman made its public debut for its first working run in private ownership. Hundreds of spectators braved the elements to watch Flying Scotsman's departure from Paddington. At Birmingham Snow Hill Station, some 8,000 people crowded onto the platform. On board were members of the Festiniog Railway Society that Pegler had done so much to save. They were on their way to their annual meeting in Port Maddock. It was the first time in its 40 years that Flying Scotsman had been to Wales. So there I was, on this board, supervising the death of steam, the thing that I was most interested in. And it was a most extraordinary experience. And uh, obviously, I mean, one had to accept the fact that this was, you know, was happening, it was going to go on happening. But um, one could well understand how Beeching uh, regarded me as a real sort of thorn in the side. There he was trying to do everything uh, to bring the modern image of British Rail to the notice of the public. And there was I trying to stir up the nostalgia of how marvellous the great days of steam had been. Didn't realise it at the time, of course. I didn't realise anything like the extent to which I was obviously upsetting the establishment by doing what I was doing. But nevertheless, it's fascinating looking back to see um, how Beeching did react, and I got uh, very pointedly, as I thought, dropped from the board. And I actually asked if I could have a head-to-head -head with Beeching, which I got. And I asked him point blank, I said, could you just uh, satisfy me on one particular point? Is the reason I'm being dropped from the uh, board uh, anything to do with the fact that I've bought the Flying Scotsman? And he looked me straight in the eye and said, as a matter of fact, yes. I said, thank you very much. But on its next run, this time to Cardiff, Flying Scotsman hit trouble. It seemed that somebody wanted to get the engine out of service. The railway magazine, I think it was, were running a special train uh, uh, in connection with one of their anniversaries, and they were using the Flying Scotsman. They had a thing which they were going to call the Welsh Mystery Flyer, and they chartered Flying Scotsman to haul the Welsh Mystery Flyer, and that was fine and uh, I, as usual, was on the engine, and we roared along in good order until we got quite close to Swindon. And then suddenly, on the footplate, we were completely immersed in steam. Couldn't see at all where we were going. And uh, we had to come right down to walking speed. And we finally got to Swindon and uh, found that a thing called the back left-hand steam chest cover had come adrift. And that could have been jolly dodgy because we would have been nipping along at over 80 miles an hour and it could have caused, you know, quite a nasty pile-up if we'd been unlucky. Well, we weren't unlucky, we were all right. The locomotive had to come off, so the, locomotive, the train had to be taken on by a diesel. The result of all that was that I was naturally very, very disappointed indeed that this had happened, the only failure we'd ever had with the Scotsman. And uh, so it came out finally that uh, somebody had got at the engine overnight, that it had definitely been sabotaged, or the insurers thought it had anyway, uh, that somebody had slackened off the nuts maliciously, or that's the word they put in the written report. And I thought, well, to hold this for a lark, let's do it anyway. So when the locomotive had been repaired, which was only a very minor repair anyway, we decided to have another go. And the run was going to be to Cardiff. And so I thought, well, look, don't, don't let's mess about. Let's go for it and try and break the record for the run from London to Cardiff. And uh, the run from London to Cardiff was just over two hours. And uh, so we set out to do exactly that. The run was made in support of the World Wildlife Fund. Pulling just five carriages and limited to 80 miles an hour, Pegler and Flying Scotsman achieved their goal. In May 1964, Flying Scotsman travelled from Doncaster to Edinburgh 
Incredible though it may seem, it was the first time the engine had been north of the border in 25 years. But by this time, long distance runs were becoming more difficult as there were few water troughs left. There were a few water troughs left, uh, but not very many. And if one was on a bit of route where there was a, a, a facility for picking up water, we'd got a scoop and we could pick up water, and that was fine. But it became quite clear that that happy state of affairs was going to end, and that when it did, one was going to have a very major problem. I mean, we came up to the eye with the idea of getting a second tender, and an awful lot of work needed doing on it. But nevertheless, we got the whole thing done, and the locomotive running with two tenders in the latter part of 1966. And uh, to me, that was the obvious solution. And in fact, with two tenders and three sets of water troughs left, we managed in 1968 to do the non-stop runs from London to Edinburgh and back successfully, both non-stop, absolutely extraordinary. It seemed Pegler's investment in Flying Scotsman had been a good one. But he had other ideas. I thought, well, it's a very good opportunity to cash in on this and take the locomotive somewhere else and run it where there won't be any problems. So uh, the approach had been made to me by um, some business people, you know. Could I run a, a sort of export train in North America, flogging, you know, British exports and all the rest of it, uh, have this train hauled by the Flying Scotsman? So I went into all this and found it could be done. Of course, it was horribly expensive to do. And I had a very good sponsor in America, a chap called Nelson Blount, who was a sort of a disciple of uh, Billy Graham. He was a very much hot gospeler man. And uh, rather sadly, he killed himself uh, in a private aeroplane. He ran out of fuel and uh, crashed in a wood, and that was the end of him. And I suppose the, the sensible thing to do would have been simply to say, well, my sponsor's gone, so forget it. We, won't, we can't possibly do it. But of course, I was by that time fired with enthusiasm and thought, well, let's go to America anyway. Pegler was a very persuasive businessman. Having lost his sponsor, he turned to Harold Wilson, who was then British Prime Minister. The idea of sending Flying Scotsman as a travelling trade show to the US had its appeal, and funds were released to help cover costs. At Liverpool docks, the Pullman carriages were loaded onto the ship. Flying Scotsman was covered in a layer of grease to protect it from the elements during the journey. In all, three ships were required to transport the entire engine, tenders and carriages. As Flying Scotsman was lifted aboard, there were those who feared this might be the last time its wheels touched British soil. Pegler had no such doubts and pressed on regardless. On September the 19th, 1969, Alan Pegler launched his American expedition in the time-honoured tradition by smashing a bottle of champagne on the buffer beam. The journey across the Atlantic took 10 days, but on arrival in Boston, they encountered the first of many setbacks. The cranes weren't strong enough to lift Flying Scotsman ashore. $15,000 later, the problem was resolved. In order to be allowed to run on American tracks, Flying Scotsman needed to meet with certain safety requirements. These included a chime steam whistle, a bell and a cow catcher. The train was also only allowed to run either as a circus or an exhibition train. As they were there to promote British business, the Pullman carriages were converted into exhibition areas. Finally, the official opening went ahead on October the 8th, 1969. But it seemed there could be trouble ahead sort of timed in with the start of the IRA troubles. Being British, we were warned that we should uh, lie low when we were leaving Boston because they were going to fire at the train. And we were particularly vulnerable in the um, um, observation coach at the back because it was all glass, so we had to keep well away from that. And we set off from Boston. The first leg of the tour was to take Flying Scotsman to Houston, Texas, a journey that was scheduled to take two months. Despite the risk of attack, 
Flying Scotsman began its journey on October the 12th. The first major stop was Penn Central Station in New Jersey on October the 19th. The journey went well, but there were yet more problems ahead. Most of the New York rail network is underground, and regulations forbade steam trains going underground using their own power. They had to be towed either by diesel or electric. Thus, Flying Scotsman was towed into New York rather than in a steaming blaze of glory. This was to be a recurring problem throughout the tour, as many metropolitan authorities regarded steam engines as potential fire hazards. The costs for the tows had to be met by Pegler and was something he'd not allowed for in his budget. But the tour seemed to be going well. On October the 30th, Flying Scotsman arrived in Atlanta, Georgia. From there, it was on to Steamarama, which was being held at Anniston, Alabama. There, Flying Scotsman was joined by historic American locomotives Southern 750 and Southern 4571. Over 10,000 people flocked to see the three engines lined up. Two hours later, Flying Scotsman was back on its way through the southern states, finally reaching Houston on November the 10th. Although the first part of the tour was over, there was still work to be done, as the engine had to be laid up for the winter. There were the remains of an old roundhouse at Slayton, Texas, which belonged to the Santa Fe Railroad. It was agreed that this is where Flying Scotsman would spend the winter while the next tour was planned. The tour had passed through 17 states and over 3,000 miles travelled. All destinations met on schedule. The 1969 tour should have been the end of Flying Scotsman's Great American Adventure. But Pegler was determined to take his train right across the United States. It was to be a costly mistake. Firstly, there'd been an election in Britain in which Harold Wilson was voted out in favour of Edward Heath's Conservatives. Because of changing priorities, the money promised by Harold Wilson to fund the tour was revoked. If Pegler wanted to carry on with the tour, he would have to finance it out of his own pocket. I managed to do a very good deal with the Santa Fe Railroad. They lent me uh, what was left of a roundhouse, a place called Slayton in Texas. So we puffed away up to, up to Slayton and put the train away, locomotive and the carriages, in this roundhouse uh, in 1969 and came back to England and found, to my well, not to horror, but I was a bit disappointed that the um, reaction of people like the Board of Trade was not all that favourable. They didn't sort of say, well, well done and jolly good show and all the rest of it. They were sort of saying, hmm, yes, well, and you're thinking of going again, are you, and all the rest of it. And there was no sort of support, whatever. I, on the other hand, had been assured that uh, if I took the locomotive back to America again, I'd be able to drive the thing myself. And that was an enormous uh, carriage, of course, because I had not been allowed to handle the controls in this country. Or officially, I hadn't, anyway. The tour went ahead, and despite crisscrossing the central and northern states as well as visiting Canada, Pegler was losing more money than he could make. By the winter of 1970, bankruptcy was looming on the horizon. I had got the idea by then that the only hope of salvation, in terms of the hope of money, was to get out to the west, and to get right across uh, to the to California. And I'd very much got San Francisco in mind. In what seemed like a last throw of the dice, Pegler persuaded the organisers of a British Week festival in San Francisco to have Flying Scotsman as the centrepiece. Arriving in October 1972, all seemed to go well. For six weeks, Flying Scotsman drew large crowds. But complaints from local restaurants that it was blocking their sea views meant that the engine had to be moved. The new location was in a remote part of town, and so visitor numbers started to decline. Inevitably, the money ran out completely. <laughs> 
penniless and owing over £130,000, Pegler returned to England. Although not before he moved Flying Scotsman to a military storage facility near Stockton, California, where it would be out of sight from creditors' lawyers. The fears expressed three and a half years earlier that Flying Scotsman might never return to England now seemed to have become a reality. It seemed a sad ending to a story that had begun 50 years earlier. I literally did lose everything. I put quite literally everything into it. I mean, it was entirely my own fault. I mean, the fact that I lost all my money, because I thought, it was having, I thought I was having a ball driving the blooming engine all around North America, which is absolutely true. And I knew exactly what I was doing. And I simply took the view, well, this is a once in a lifetime chance. But all was not lost. A new chapter was about to begin. William Bill McAlpine was a member of a family that had made a fortune in the construction industry. He was an avid railway enthusiast who had even built his own full-sized railway in the grounds of his Buckinghamshire estate. Alan Pegler I met in about 1965 or 6, not long after he got Scotsman, and he, he ran, a, ran a trip to the Fastiniog Railway for the shareholder special and I was invited on it. Um, and, and I met him there, briefly, because he was quite busy on the footplate and running the thing. I've always been interested in railways, and, um, but I suppose my involvement with Flying Scotsman was, was almost by mistake. Alan Bloom of Bressingham Hall rang up one day and said, look, uh, we understand that Scotsman's in trouble in America, and shouldn't we do something about it? So I said, I really didn't think we should, but the thing to do was to get hold of George Hinchcliffe, who had managed the um, tour, the previous tour, um, which I did, and he, he said he'd be defiant, delighted to go over as long as somebody paid his fare. Miraculously, George Hinkcliffe managed to smuggle Flying Scotsman out of its storage facility and onto a ship bound for England before any outstanding creditors realised. It was a cold day in February 1973 that the ship carrying Flying Scotsman docked in Liverpool. This time, there were no pipers or champagne, just relief that a much-loved national treasure had finally returned to Great Britain. The last few years had not been kind to Flying Scotsman, and so first task on its return was to get the engine back to the Derby Works for repairs and a new coat of paint. Richard Marsh, then chairman of British Rail, was on hand to crack the obligatory bottle of champagne, launching Flying Scotsman on the next stage of its career. William McAlpine owned Flying Scotsman for 23 years, during which it regularly hauled trains on the main line, as well as becoming a star attraction at Heritage Railways. It also underwent two major overhauls. Any thoughts that Flying Scotsman might be gently heading for retirement were rudely dispelled when in 1988, William McAlpine was asked if he would send Flying Scotsman to Australia as part of their bicentennial celebrations. For their bicentenary, they had this marvellous idea they'd have a locomotive from each continent. And could they have Flying Scotsman? Well, I said, <laughs> you could have her uh, if we have a um, return ticket in our hot sticky hands. We've lost her once, we don't want to do it again. <laughs> so we were well insured as far as that was concerned. After a voyage of five weeks, Flying Scotsman made its first public appearance in late October. From then, until November 1989, Flying Scotsman travelled all over Australia, racking up over 28,000 miles. On the 8th of August 1989, Flying Scotsman set a new world record for a steam locomotive by pulling a train 422 miles non-stop in 9 hours 25 minutes. We, we went up into Alice Springs and um, Alice Springs I'd visited 
a couple of years before because I thought I'd never go there again. And I said, certainly never thought I'd go there on a locomotive. And we were the first standard gauge steam locomotive ever to go to Alice Springs. In 28 days, we did 4,000 miles. In Australia, we, we, we were the, um, carried out the longest non-stop steam run. And nine days later, we set off to go to Perth. Now, Perth is two and a half thousand miles from uh, Sydney, and uh, we did that in five days. And basically, we steamed night and day with just servicing stops thrown in at around every two and a half, uh, two, 250 miles. The uh, rest of the time, we were basically travelling, day and night. And uh, so we, we were taking it in turns to be on the footplate and uh, we had two sets of men uh, crewing the locomotive. So we've been across the longest piece of straight railway in the world um, twice. Um, which is 297 miles without a bend. Despite the long journeys, there were opportunities for flying Scotsmen to run alongside preserved Australian steam locomotives. Come November 1989, it was time for flying Scotsmen to return home. Although it resumed carrying passengers on day trips, Flying Scotsman was not in good shape. Between 1992 and 1995, Flying Scotsman had completed over 30,000 miles. It was also proving very expensive to keep running, despite the regular visits to heritage railways and mainline runs. To help spread the costs, William McAlpine merged his interests in Flying Scotsman with those of music impresario Pete Waterman. I went into partnership with uh, Pete Waterman, who uh, was um, uh, interested in, in the locomotive. And um, we bought the special trains unit from, from British Rail. Uh, and with one thing and another, um, really the main interest was uh, in the trains, running the trains of coaches for, for charter. And Scotsman by that stage was needing an overhaul, was actually in bits. Um, and she wasn't the main part of the business. Flying Scotsman was now 70 years old and problems were beginning to mount up. I've been involved with Flying Scotsman basically uh, when it came back from Australia. Um, and in those days, we were involved in keeping the locomotive running as it went around the private railways. Um, the biggest problem with the locomotive was that it was well and truly worn out. The, uh, the piston rods were actually oval and um, the packings were made to the round. So no sooner had we fitted the things and a couple of weeks later, we were actually having to go back and, and replace them. Anyway, this, this went on until we got to the stage at Langotham where the boiler failed, and that was the end of it. The damage caused by the derailment was so severe that Flying Scotsman had to be immediately withdrawn from service. It was returned to its operating base at Southall to await what would be a major overhaul. The alignment of the frames, we found, was, was out. The locomotive was canting to one side at the front of it. So, um, we had to straighten the frames, and this is done by using a riveting gun and peening up and down the frame. The middle cylinder, um, when we examined it, was found to be badly cracked on this locomotive. Um, so we, the decision was made to use the spare one, which came off a locomotive called Salmon Trout. But our major problem was that that cylinder that came off Salmon Trout um, would not just drop into, into the frames simply because the, the bolt holes were different. Every single bolt had to be made because they fitted bolts and they had to be driven in. Um, and that took us months. All the while Flying Scotsman was confined to the workshops, it wasn't earning any income. In fact, it was costing a small fortune. As a result, Flying Scotsman 
was put up for sale. Once again, Flying Scotsman found a new saviour. Biotech entrepreneur Tony Marchington agreed to buy the loco and a set of carriages for £1.5 million. Pounds. I first saw it when I was 17 years of age and um, I, I just passed scholarship papers to Oxford and um, it was a bright spring morning, uh, in late March, and my, my mother woke me up and said, get up, she said, get out, down to the village, we're all going down to see why and Scotsman come through. What happened subsequently was I, uh, in the early, eight, early, early 90s, having put together a collection of, of steam traction engines, uh, I did other things before biotechnology, probably do other things after biotechnology too, and um, I, uh, I, I wanted to buy a steam locomotive, and I started to look first for what was the, the Gresley A4 class, the streamlined class. Couldn't find one of those. And then I bought a video of, of the A4 class, and the, uh, this video, the reporter said, um, oh, we, we, uh, we saw uh, the sticker A4 come through, uh, but we kept our cameras running because we knew Flying Scots was coming. And I saw the video, and right behind it came Scots, and I thought, yeah, that's of its own. But once work on the overhaul started, more problems came to light. It was the drag box. It was in fact found to be uh, in a much worse condition than uh, was anticipated. And the, the, old, the old casting is, is in fact right behind me, it's at the side of the chimney there. It's absolutely certain that that's been in the engine since it was first built, um, something over 70 years ago. Um, now that was taken out and the new one was fabricated and put in and of course nothing quite fits the way you think it does so it all has to be actually made to fit at, at the point of fitting it, you know. In the end, it took three years to complete the overhaul, at that point the most extensive in its history. It also cost another £1 million, an overrun that had not been planned for. But on the 4th of July 1999, Flying Scotsman arrived at King's Cross, ready to haul its next train to York, resplendent in its LNER colour scheme. But Tony Marchington's ownership of Flying Scotsman was to be brief. The losses were too much to sustain. And in 2003, he was declared bankrupt. Flying Scotsman had swallowed up another fortune. In early 2004, the debt agency, acting on behalf of Tony Marchington's Flying Scotsman business, announced that it would hold a sealed bid auction for the loco to be held at the beginning of April. Fearing that the engine might fall into foreign hands, the National Rail Museum announced it would put in a bid and launched an appeal for funds. Thanks to a grant from the National Heritage Lottery Fund and private donations, the National Rail Museum's £2.3 million bid won the day. Not only did the nation now own Flying Scotsman, but also a spare boiler and cylinders and a support coach. For the next year, Flying Scotsman occasionally hauled special trains, but its poor condition meant there were too many failures while out on the main line, despite intermittent repairs. It was clear that another major overhaul was needed. It was estimated that the work would take about a year at a cost of £750,000. It was to be another 10 years and a cost of £4.5 million before Flying Scotsman was next seen hauling carriages on the main line. Today, Flying Scotsman continues to haul special trains on the main line and visit heritage railways. Nobody could have imagined that a hundred years later, Flying Scotsman would still be hauling trains. Steam locomotives are limited to 75 miles an hour, but that's not a problem for these, these machines. Uh, we still have to bear in mind the same criteria that would for any other steam operation. Um, ensuring that the paths are there and that network rail can squeeze us in. 75 miles an hour is quite fast for a steam train, but it's, in the greater scheme of things, you're fitting in with 100, you know, 125 mile an hour expresses on, say, the East Coast Main Line. 
So you've got to be able to ensure that you can duck in and duck out and keep out of the way or be put out of the way so as not to upset the other schedules. In some areas, they're, I mean, they're very different, obviously, but the train's still a train. But it, I think Sir Peter Parker has said, steam warms the market. It gets people onto trains who've probably never travelled on trains. You know, we do get a lot of younger children who come and Thomas the Tank Engine has done a lot for, for, the, for, the, for the cause. So a lot of people who've never seen or ridden on trains before, this is the ultimate experience, I suppose. Uh, there are the preserved private railways, but obviously they are rather more limited in their scope and what they can do. Here you're actually having a ride at speed on a main line with big engines and a little taste of what it used to be like. Like many other steam locos, keeping engines running requires a lot of time and skill. There still seem to be enough volunteers willing to put in their time supporting these magnificent machines. More concerning is finding the skills needed to maintain and repair them. There's two act uh, factors to that. One is that the, the particular skills relative to steam engines um, uh, are in fact disappearing. Um, and in general, they have disappeared from, uh, uh, for the most part. But people of my generation and the generation after mine um, who can remember them in service are the one, they're the people that want to see them running. And there is a general feeling amongst the whole preservation movement that it's going to be more and more difficult to get the people to be able to look after them in the future. And the other side of that kind is that there'll probably be less people that are interested in seeing them because they never saw them in service days. And um, I mean, I, like people of my generation, I was a train spotter when I was 11 or 12 years of age and, and would cycle long distances to go and see them. Um, you won't find that there, but the people that uh, were born 40 years ago, they never saw them in service, so they're uh, astounded to see one running now, but it doesn't go much further than that. And uh, so there is a, a decline in the interest, there's a decline in the skill levels. Um, those people that are in those younger years, they do want to get involved in it. They go to a private railway and they uh, learn the skills from someone, for example, of my age. Um, and uh, so it's a handing down process. They're not amateurs. I mean, the only difference is they don't get paid. Um, the groups that look after these locomotives now have to work to very high and very prescribed standards. Uh, the general standards of engineering and the requirements for engineering are very high and they're now mandated and documented. And these guys have learned a lot. I mean, steam finished 1968, so 40 years ago. And in that time, a lot has been learned. And with, as part of the privatization process of the railways, a lot of the systems and processes had to be documented in a very short period of time. And these are known as group standards, uh, railway group standards. And they are, in many respects, a fantastic set of documents because it actually brought everything together under one publication. And you basically, you work to those or you make the application for the deviations away from them. And then that's considered by the, the panels that need to have a look at it. And then, then you end up with want the better, awful old cliche, you get all the ticks in the box and then you can run. Today, heritage steam lines, large and small, are as popular as ever, attracting visitors of all ages, especially when a big engine like Flying Scotsman comes to visit. Arguably, if asked, most people can name at least two trains, Thomas the Tank Engine and Flying Scotsman. There's nothing quite like the spectacle of a large locomotive running on the main line. And a privileged few know what it's like to drive one. If, if you've never been on a front plate of a steam engine, it's difficult to, for anybody to, want, um, to pass it on. But it's a unique experience. It really is unique to be on um, one of those, or indeed 
many other engines as well at uh, speeds of 70 or 80 mile an hour. It's, uh, it's a unique experience. I suppose uh, somebody who drove a Ferrari did go on about their experience. And uh, again, if you've never done it, you can't quite uh, hand it on to the major bus. But once you have, uh, you don't want to let it go. It's amazing that Flying Scotsman's still running a hundred years since it was built. It was never meant to survive this long. At the time when decisions were being made about what to save for the nation, Flying Scotsman wasn't even considered unique or historically important enough to preserve. But it had a name. And that was enough on which to build a legend. It's a legend that seduced many and cost several men their fortunes. But can Flying Scotsman run forever? The answer is probably yes, but at a price. It is, after all, a mechanical object made of steel, and as parts wear out, they can be replaced, provided the necessary skills also survive. After all the overhauls, little of the original engine now exists, but then the legend that is the Flying Scotsman may be enough to see it through decades to come.